the late 1940s, when the first atom bombs were exploded, some people feared that a nuclear reaction would result and cause the Earth's atmosphere to ignite and destroy everything. When the new millennium was ushered in on January 1st, 2000, some people feared that all of the world's computers would crash and plunge the world into chaos. But that didn't materialize either, did it? Many today feel that the end of the world will be the result of a disease pandemic that sweeps the globe, killing billions of people. Will the Ebola virus or the bird flu or some bacteria resistant to modern antibiotics cause the end of humanity? Some have theorized that a large comet or an asteroid will strike the Earth and cause the great cataclysm that ends humanity once and for all. There are those who see global warming as a major threat that will ultimately doom the whole planet. Some feel that the Earth will eventually be burned up by the sun. Will the world come to an end? And if it does, then how will the world end? Do the strange visions of the book of Revelation have anything to say about the end of the world? If you're looking for wild speculations, you're in the wrong place. But if you want to know what the Bible actually says, then join us for this fascinating edition of Biblion, Mysteries of the Apocalypse. I really don't know. I know the word says that no man knows the day or the hour when the coming of the Lord will come, you know, when the Lord will come. So I really don't know. Yes. Because it's getting too corrupt. Um, yes. Because there's global warming and all that stuff. In our lifetime, no, I don't believe that at all. I mean, that would be kind of ridiculous to believe that the world would end in our lifetime. Um, I mean, we still have plenty of years to go. For a thousand years, I know that there's going to be a reign where um, the Antichrist will reign, but those at the end of the world, some will be, um, will be allowed to, to meet Christ. The end of the world, everybody dies. Um, there won't be any more life on Earth or anything. Probably a lot of people will um, die, but I don't think everybody will be wiped off the planet. So I'm not sure what will happen exactly, but probably be a natural disaster. The book of Revelation is primarily concerned with the great persecution that was carried out against the Christians in the first three centuries of our era. The Apostle John himself and the Christians to whom he originally wrote the book of Revelation were undergoing economic hardships, they were undergoing imprisonment, and even death at the hands of the Roman emperors and their representatives. While much of the ancient revelation describes the hardships of the Roman persecution, the book also holds forth the common Christian hope of the eventual return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the last judgment, followed by an eternity in either torment or bliss. The book of Revelation is filled with allusions to the prophecies of the Old Testament scriptures. Among the many Old Testament allusions in Revelations, it is not surprising that some of them involve its descriptions of the end of the world and the afterlife. The 
There's very little in the Old Testament about the resurrection of the dead in the final judgment. But the prophecy of Daniel is closely related to Revelation. And in the latter part of that prophecy of Daniel, the resurrection and the ultimate fate of those who are raised is mentioned. The ancient prophecy says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In the 20th chapter, the book of Revelation pictures a resurrection of the dead and a final judgment. Like Jesus foretold in John's Gospel, Revelation 20 pictures all of the dead being raised and all of the dead appearing before God's great white throne to give an account of themselves to God. There is a definite time sequence of events in the latter chapters of the book of Revelation that at least generally indicates how events will progress at the end. First, according to the timeline of Revelation, comes the fall of the great persecutor, the destruction of the Roman Empire, the beast, and the destruction of those who promoted the emperor worship, or the false prophet. These two villains are cast into the lake of fire at that time. This is all described in Revelation chapter 19. Historically, the end of the persecution and the destruction of the Roman Empire happened in the 4th and 5th centuries of our era, when the risen Christ used the barbarian armies from the east to destroy the power of Rome. The destruction of the Roman persecutor happens first. After Rome's destruction, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, Satan was bound for a thousand years. God's great avenging angel, called Abaddon in Hebrew, or Apollyon in Greek, or simply destroyer in our language, bound or limited Satan after Rome's demise, so that he could not perpetrate the kind of persecution on God's people that was experienced under the evil empire of Rome. During this time when Satan is bound, the martyrs who were killed during the great persecution are now living and reigning with Jesus Christ in heaven. We know that this period of time, called the millennium, followed the demise of the Roman Empire and the end of the great persecution. Since few numbers in Revelation are really meant literally, I do not believe that the thousand years is a literal thousand years but it's just a representation of a very long period of time. It may be that we are still living in that time period of relative peace, which is called the millennium, even today. After that millennium, or thousand years, described in Revelation 20, we're told in Revelation 20, verse 7, that Satan, or the dragon, will be released for a short time. Now, when you compare a short time with a thousand years, it obviously indicates a much shorter time than the millennium. During this short time, after the millennium, Satan will try to marshal the forces of evil against the people of God. Unlike the great Roman persecution, his effort will not come to fruition. Revelation describes this time when Satan will gather his forces against God's people in the following way. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison 
and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. According to the passage we just cited, after Satan is released from his period of restriction, he will try to marshal his forces against God's people. But where does the present time fit in this sequence of events? It is impossible to tell from Scripture whether we are still living in the millennium or whether we are living in that brief time when Satan is released and is trying to bring the forces of evil against God's people one last time. Is it possible that Revelation 20, 7 through 9 is about the rise and threat of some atheistic communist regime from the East? Could this passage be speaking of the present threat from Islamic extremists and the armies they control? Could this passage be describing an enemy that will come from an emerging nation and try unexpectedly to suppress Christianity? Any of these things is theoretically possible, but we cannot know what these verses describe with any kind of certainty because Scripture remains vague about it. What Revelation does say emphatically is that Satan's efforts to ravage and destroy the people of God will not be successful and that Satan and his allies will be destroyed in the end. Satan's efforts will fail and he will be consigned once and for all to the lake of fire. I do believe in heaven and hell. Yes, I do. Yes. And I believe that those that accept Christ as Savior um, ha will be going to heaven and those that don't make a choice is the choice to go to hell. Yes, sir. Why is that? Because I've been run over five times by five automobiles and I'm still here. Yes, because I believe in God, but I don't really believe in the devil. Uh, not really, no. Um, I mean, I believe in spirit spirituality, but religion itself, uh, organized religion, I don't believe in that. That's uh, a lot of hogwash and... I do believe that there is a final judgment for everything that we do in this world. Um, I believe that all of it, I believe, I believe there is. Judgment day come, then you got to deal with it. Oh, um, not really. He's a good person, so I don't think he'll be judgmental. We've been having 50,000 years of human life on the planet, and I don't think final judgment will decide if people will stay on earth or not. I mean, that's not... According to the last part of Revelation, after Satan is destroyed, all of the dead will be raised to face a final confrontation at the throne of God. At that time, humanity will be divided between the eternal lake of fire on the one hand and the bliss of the holy city of God, paradise, the new Jerusalem on the other hand. There is a definite time sequence here as described in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. One of the ways that we can determine if we are interpreting Revelation properly 
regarding the end of time is to see what the rest of the Bible clearly teaches about the end of the world. Then we can determine if any of this clear teaching contradicts our understanding of the more difficult book of Revelation. Well, first of all, Jesus himself said that no one would be able to predict the time of his second coming. He said, Of that day and hour no man knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but the Father only. Jesus also said that there was work to be done before the coming of the end. He explained to his apostles, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus clearly promised that the dead would be raised and that he would eventually return. In John's gospel, Jesus said, The hour is coming when all that are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and those that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. In Jesus' story of the wise and foolish virgins, Jesus emphasized that he would be gone for an extended period of time, and he would return for a reckoning when he was least expected. Before his death, as he sat with his disciples during the Last Supper, Jesus promised them, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. As Jesus ascended into heaven before the eyes of his apostles, 40 days after his resurrection, the angels promised, This Jesus who was taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you beheld him going into heaven. Peter wrote to Christians about patiently waiting for the promise of Christ's coming and assured his readers that the day of the Lord will come. The Apostle Paul wrote extensively in his letters to the church at Thessalonica about the coming of the Lord Jesus. Paul assured these Christians that when Christ returned, he would deliver them from God's wrath, which would be poured out on an ungodly mankind. He told his readers not to worry about their fellow Christians who had died because they would be raised from the dead when Jesus returned. Paul wrote that Jesus would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, the Christian dead would rise, and then the living Christians would be, he said, caught up together with those who were raised from the dead, so they would all meet Christ together in the sky. This event, when the living and the dead are caught up together to meet Jesus, is often called the rapture. It's because of the Greek word Paul used, meaning to be caught up, and the way that it's pronounced is something like the word rapture. This rapture of the living and the dead Christians is to happen at the end of time when Christ returns. With equal force, Paul wrote that when Jesus returned, he would come with his angels and would take vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus' brother, Judas, most often known to us as Jude, wrote that Christ would come again to bring judgment on all of the ungodly. On the day when Christ returns, Peter says the earth itself will be destroyed. As God destroyed the ancient world with the flood in the time of Noah, so he will destroy the entire earth by fire, erasing life as we now know it. The book of Revelation agrees with all of this when it describes the end, saying, The first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea is no more. Both Peter and the book of Revelation 
also describe a new heaven and a new earth which awaits God's people after the final judgment. According to Revelation 20, all of the dead, whether they are good or evil, will be raised from the dead and will give an account before the throne of God at the very end. This will take place after the millennium and after the destruction of Satan. At that time, the books of Scripture will be opened as the standard of judgment for all of humanity. These are the books that tell about God and His character. These are the books that tell us about sin and repentance. These are the books that tell us about God's love and sending Christ and about man's responsibility to accept God's mercy by submitting to Christ and to His authority. The teachings of Scripture will be weighed against the deeds of each human being as each human being hears his or her fate from God. The great book of life the roster of God's saved people will also be there at the judgment. According to Revelation 20 verse 15, those whose names cannot be found in the book of life because they have never accepted God's mercy or because they have turned their backs on Christ will be cast into the lake of fire along with the beast, the false prophet, and with Satan himself. This matches perfectly with what Jesus taught in Matthew 25, where he pictured humanity standing before the throne of Christ, separated into two groups. Some, said Jesus, would hear the words, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Others, unfortunately, would hear the words, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. According to the book of Revelation, those whose names are in the book of life will experience all of the joys of a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. These people who have turned to God in repentance, these people who have accepted the grace and mercy of Christ by obeying the gospel, will enjoy the beauty and the peace of a new and perfect creation. Revelation uses the language of the Old Testament prophets to picture this place of peace and happiness that will be the ultimate reward of the faithful. Though the earth as we know it will have been destroyed by fire, there will be a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, where God will live together with man just like it was in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. Using language from the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, the holy city, New Jerusalem, is described in Revelation 21 and 22. No one will enter that city except those whose names are in God's book of life. The city, the New Jerusalem, is a place of beauty, a place of safety and security, a place of healing, According to Revelation 22, the tree of life will be there and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. There will be no need for sun or moon because the Lord God and the Lamb will be its light. And there will be no need to close the gates for there will be no evil to threaten it anymore. The book of Revelation ends with the promise that Jesus will bring about the final destruction of Satan the final judgment of humanity, and the final assignment of all humanity to the lake of fire or to the beautiful New Jerusalem. This hope of Christ's return and the ultimate reward and punishment that would accompany His return has always been at the very heart of the Christian faith.
So what do we say to those who claim we can see today's headlines on the pages of Revelation and that the end of the world is imminent? Well, biblically speaking, the book of Revelation is mainly a prophecy of encouragement for the early Christians who were undergoing the great persecution under the Roman Empire during the time of the Emperor Domitian. Most of the specific events and circumstances mentioned in Revelation have long since happened and have absolutely no literal reference to modern life today. Now that being said, two great facts remain true. Number one, the principles of Revelation remain just as true today. The risen Christ is still walking among his churches. He still knows our works and still calls us to do his will. He still urges us to endure struggles and to be faithful to him at the same time. He still promises that the forces of Christ and the armies of heaven will be victorious over Satan and all of his allies. Secondly, the book of Revelation agrees with the rest of the Bible that humanity will face an ultimate end. Satan will be destroyed. Christ will return. The dead will be raised. And this earth will be destroyed by fire. Every human being will stand before God's throne. All will be relegated either to the lake that burns with fire and brimstone or to the holy city, New Jerusalem, where we will live forever in paradise. If these things are true, and I believe with all my heart that they are, it totally affects how we view the world and how we choose to live our lives today. As Peter said so well, if all these things are thus to be dissolved, what kind of people ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? The mysteries of the book of Revelation, like the teachings of the rest of the Bible, compel man to hear the word of God, to accept and obey it, and to live expecting the return of Christ and our ultimate date with God. I hope you've enjoyed exploring the mysteries of the apocalypse with me, but much more than that, I pray that you will think soberly about the things that we have learned and resolve to prepare yourself for what is surely coming in the future. May God help you to do these things, and may he bless you until we come to you again with another installment of Biblion, Bible Mysteries Revealed.